Listen to the 48 Hours podcast for shocking murder cases and compelling real life dramas from one of television's most watched true crime shows. Go behind the scenes of each episode with award winning CBS News correspondents and producers in Post Mortem, a weekly deep dive. Listen to 48 Hours wherever you get your podcasts. You like this title. Fill in the blanks is, is ridiculous. You just don't like it. I don't like it, no. You're making a mockery of the podcast industry. Okay. Yeah. And I am really curious about your approach to comedy. Do well, I have an approach to comedy? Yeah, do I mean, you? <laughs> she was having this nightmare and she's yelling like all night long and I said, what's going on? And she said, a skunk was spraying me. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> cute and innocent that uh, at four years old, the greatest villain in the world is a skunk. Hey, that was Jimmy Kimmel you were listening to, and let me tell you how much fun this was. I've been a guest on his show like 25 times. I finally got him in the chair where I was asking the questions, and it was a lot of fun. Look, this guy is a good guy from the inside out. He's smart. He's witty. He's a lot of fun. You're going to really enjoy this conversation because he really let down, and we just had a good conversation. So lean back. Listen to me asking the questions of Jimmy Kimmel. I'm Katie Maloney, I'm 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. <laughs> the foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started but this we're podcast. Not, not saying that join our cult i mean community i mean the coven religion okay, let's just stick with community listen to the podcast listen to the podcast <laughs> so i've really been anxious to talk to you because you always interview me and i never get to interview you okay and i am really curious about your approach to comedy do well, i have an approach to comedy yeah do I mean, you <laughs> i mean because it I seems do. like everything's political well nowadays it is well you know what it really is it's Current event based, and that is what dominates the news now. And ten years ago, current, you know, politics were just as important as sports were just as important as whatever was going on on Jersey Shore. But nowadays, it seems to be, you know, it's what everyone's. I try to, you know, a guy gave me great advice once. A gentleman named Gary Wall. He was my boss at a radio station in Tampa, and I used to like to do these things that were. Yeah, I thought they were funny, but looking back, I realized I was the only one that thought they were funny. <laughs> and he said to me, and I'll never forget it, he said, you are jerking yourself off. Stop jerking yourself off. What do you mean? What were you doing? It, they were like inside jokes, and I really wasn't necessarily concerned with the audience's involvement. It's easy on radio to forget about the audience. Yeah. And I took that to heart, and I've tr always try to remember that, and I actually say that sometimes to our writer, I go, you're jerking yourself off because they try to like, and it's always like, oh, let's do a thing about this woman who works down the hall. And I realize like nobody at home cares. Nobody about knows about her. Yeah. And yeah. that's an, that's an important lesson. It takes a long time to learn. How much of what you do now is political? Do you think it's like 80 percent? Well, the monologue you're speaking of, yeah. because yeah, with the guest segments are yeah, rarely you had political. The guests, you talk to the guests about whatever they're talking about, right? I would say it's probably 70%. That'd be my guess. Do you get tired of that? Sometimes, yeah, I do. And sometimes I feel I have to remind myself that it's not it's not necessary that I, I'm not running a newspaper. I don't have to report on every story of the day. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But sometimes I feel like I have to. I just want to talk about I want to give my spin on what people are already talking about. Do you put your point of view into it or do you put the writer's point of view into it? Is I, it just you? Uh I try to train the writers to adopt my kind of point of view, but it's definitely, I write a lot of the monologue myself. I, I sit down and I write six or seven pages every night from two to 4 PM. And then I go on stage and deliver it from five to 6 PM. Do you worry about half of the country feels one way and the other half feels another way? So if you take 
positions like anti-administration or pro-administration that it alienates half of the people? Well, obviously I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I just operate from, I don't even, you know, I, I'm sure other people look at it differently, but I, to me, like with the current administration, I don't look at it as, as Republican versus Democrat. I look at it as a lunatic has been elected the president of the United States and we should all be aware of this and we should all be reminded that it's not, normal and that what's going on is not okay. How do you think that happened? How do I think he got elected? Yeah. Well, I don't think his opponent was maybe as as likable as as we would hope she would have been. I think that there's I think there's just a natural ebb and flow when it comes to politics, you know. Uh it, it it's never going to be one party for any period of time greater than 8 years, you know. Eventually people decide okay, it's time to do something else, and they will pick the There are only two options, really, and they'll pick the other option. Here's my question. You're the perfect person to ask this. I'm going to ask you a lot of psychological questions, so you get to be psychological. Is there any danger I'll be institutionalized at the end of this? There's a fair chance you could get 5150 before you get out of the building. Would you like me to lay down so I could really get into it? Not or? yet. Okay, all right. Not yet. There may be a time I lay you down. Okay. Yeah. Robert Kraft style? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, this could be a happy ending. Maybe it won't. <laughs> um, this is what I don't get. Okay. Because you have a great ability to talk about all the issues and not get mean spirited. Do you think you get mean spirited? I try not to. I occasionally can get mean spirited. I will tell you that I think that if I have one gift, that is the gift that I have because, uh, and my mother has it too. And in fact, my mother was class wit of her high school in Brooklyn, a huge high school in Brooklyn. And I, re I went through her yearbook once and it was really funny. People were right, like, oh, you say the, you know, the funniest, most true things. And she would say things that from some people could be considered mean, but they weren't taken as such because I don't ever want to hurt anybody's feelings. Even if I don't like somebody, I do not want to hurt their feelings. And on, and on the occasions that I have hurt people's feelings, it bothers me, it haunts me, and I think about it sometimes for the rest of my life. Really? Yeah. So whose feelings have you hurt that really bother you? I've hurt a lot. Of, you know, the one person, if I had to say above all, there was a man on a game show I hosted called Win Ben Stein's Money. Right. And he's a big show? fat guy. Yeah. And I just made fun of how fat he was the whole time. Well, and you're I, still calling him big and fat. Yeah, but he's not here, and he doesn't oh. know I'm talking about him. Yeah. So it All right, look him up. Feelings. We're going to call him and tell him he's still dogging on him. <laughs> Another punch in his stomach. But he uh, and he took it well. He wasn't like devastated or anything. But that was part of what made it painful is that he was a good sport and I just felt like I was mean and I went too far and I probably embarrassed him and I I felt bad about it. Still I still feel bad, bad about it. It was 20 years ago. Because you felt like you were picking on him and he wasn't an equal match. He couldn't fight back. Yeah, well, that was part of it. Yeah, I mean, I'm the uh, host of the show, and you're never really on equal footing with someone when you're the host of the show. And because you pick on me all the time when I'm there, and you don't give a shit. <laughs> you know why I don't you give a all. shit? Because you don't give a shit. That's exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think you are one of my favorite guests to have on the show because of that. Because there are a lot of people you have to be very careful with, and they take themselves very seriously. And you do not take yourself very seriously. Not at all. And that's, I think, why we have fun whenever you're on the show. Yeah, we do. We do skits every time. It's always something goofy that's every hilarious. Every time you come on the show, I have to go through all the listings to see what sh what the topics yeah. were that this I month. I know. You read them off. <laughs> I love And them. I can't tell if you're making them up or that really was a title. Because <laughs> I don't know the titles when I do them. They put those on after. I have no idea whether you're kidding me or they're real. Next time we'll do a quiz and you can figure out whether you, you did this show or you didn't to the show yeah because i have no idea <laughs> i really don't i mean i believe it i'm like that i go home yeah. people are like how was the show tonight i go that was pretty good they say, who's on i go hmm let me think about it yeah uh, what i like to do is walk into a restaurant or something they say what happened to that lady today i'm like <laughs> i shot that six weeks ago <laughs> i've had 14 guests today and you asked me about six weeks ago at least you have six weeks behind you I, for me usually it's an hour ours turned usually within a few days but sometimes it gets old 
but you really don't get mean-spirited. And what I'm curious about is until the last, I don't know, maybe three, four years, maybe it's this administration, maybe it was before, people could disagree. It could be a Democrat, a Republican. It could be somebody who was just on different sides of an issue. They could vehemently disagree about something, talk about it, and then go to lunch and have a good time, Yeah, go to a wedding together or whatever. And that's not the case anymore. People now, I mean, it's like McCarthyism both ways. And I don't understand that. What the hell happened? Donald J. Trump happened. That's what happened. You think it's just since him? 100%. I do. You don't think it was that way before? I think it started with Fox News. I think that was the beginning of it. I think they realized, they, they kind of figured out along the way that if they push certain buttons, that um, that the, their ratings would increase, their engagement increased. And I think they moved in a, um, a, a certain direction along the way. And there are certain people who only watch Fox News. They believe this idea, this nonsensical idea that... CNN is fake news and that they're, you know, heavily biased, that there's some equality between the like the Fox News on one side and CNN on the other side, which I don't agree with at all. And as a result, of that, you believe what you hear, you know, you're in your circle of people that you trust and people that you trust are the people you watch on television and the and heels of people have dug in their heels. And I think that you know, I think that most Democrats, most liberals you talk to long for the days of George Bush. And obviously he was not particularly popular um, at the time, at the time. But we now look back on it and you go like, OK, well, at least this is a person who if you got hit by a car might help you up. Yeah. Well, you see now at a funeral, Bush giving Michelle Obama a piece of candy yeah. and they're laughing or something, whatever. And not that they're laughing at a funeral, but I mean, yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're teaching. Treating each other with civility. Yes. And actually friends. And I don't get how we're ever going to close any kind of gap or come up with any kind of reasonable compromise as long as people are running away from each other instead of towards each other. Well, that's where we need leadership, I guess. You know, that's where we need leadership on both sides to show us that it's okay to do that and that it's not about television ratings and it's about the good of the country. It just seems to me that people are getting more polarized by the minute. And I don't get college campuses where you were supposed to have a free flow of ideas, and now they're banning people from college campuses on both conservative and liberal. Let's be honest, more liberals banning conservatives from college campuses. But not totally. Yeah, but not totally. But yeah, that's just, you know, young people, a lot of young people young like young audiences aren't necessarily great for comedians you go to a college nowadays and and they just they they take things and i don't want to generalize because it's certainly not the case for everyone but as a group as when you talk to comedians about going to a college campus or even i notice like if my audience is particularly young they they don't know if it's okay to laugh sometimes they they haven't had that life experience that tells them like this is worth fighting for this is worth being offended by this is not do you ever lose an audience early if you say something and you feel like i've lost them for the night i know if i've lost them typically before i even walk out i can tell just by listening to them from backstage whether you know sometimes it's funny because sometimes you'll get a guest on the show who's like you know maybe you know we have a wide variety of guests maybe you get like a metal band or you get a, a really hot pop group and a lot of your audience is written in well in advance because they want to see that guest. And then sometimes you feel like you're visiting someone else's show. So those are the nights where it can be a little bit rough, but typically they're on my side every once in a while though. They're not. And you feel that. And you can feel it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The guests have more of an issue with it than, than it, because the guests are, visitor so almost everyone who's there is there to see me in general but sometimes the right. guests can lose the audience yeah because they got some agenda they're running well a lot of times is if the guest goes after me in some way the audience will turn on them because they like me that's why they're there yeah 
and I'm I'm okay with anything. I'm okay with a guest turning on me. I enjoy it actually. It's a fun change of pace. Yeah, that's a foolish thing for a guest though to come to somebody's show and attack them. People don't know that though until they in fact they sometimes don't learn it. Even when it's happening, they don't know why it's happening. I see it here. If I have somebody get disrespectful with me, because I don't have random audiences where they pull up down at Hollywood and buy a bus, say you want to see a TV show. Right. These fans are Dr. Phil fans, and they've right. written in nine months in advance, and they get here, and then if somebody's disrespectful, it's like, eh, yeah, I have the same thing, and they, and I got to, oh, it's okay, 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 <laughs> because they'll get hostile, yeah, they'll turn into a mob in a hurry, and that's fun for you, right? Yeah, yeah, I got to calm them down though, because they'll, yeah, you know, they <laughs> like rush the stage, <laughs> like, okay, just hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, yeah. Did you ever think you were going to be on TV? No, never. What did you think you were going to do? I wanted to be on the radio, and that's all I really ever But you wanted. did want to be an entertainer. You wanted to be on the radio. I did want to be on the radio, yeah. How did you know that? I was. I always wanted to be an artist when I was a kid. I, was, uh, I draw. I enjoy doing that sort of thing. I was known for that in school. And I started watching David Letterman, and I started listening to Howard Stern, and I just thought it would be fun to be on the radio. And I happened to work at this clothing store with a guy who had a job at a college radio station. And he said, you're funny. You should be on the radio. And I said, yeah, you know, I'd like to be on the radio. And so he talked to his boss and his boss put me on Sunday nights for a half hour late at night. And I would interview local people in Las Vegas. I'd go through the yellow pages and find guests. I find like the hairstylist of the stars. And I'd interview him for a half hour about what's usually there were no stars, but uh, or like a local car dealer who did TV commercials. And I'd interview them and I'd you know, I was a kid and I'd kind of make fun of them and I loved it. I'd come home and my parents had listened to it and my friends listened to it and it was very exciting and I was turned on by it. So you just pick people out of the yellow pages? Yeah, I would find my guests in the yellow pages, yeah. <laughs> and they want to be on the radio so they would come. Yeah, they go, okay, you know, some kids calling from a college radio station. I was in high school at the time and they're like, yeah, all right, I'll 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 come in and they'd come in and... You know, I weighed like 112 pounds. I'd, <laughs> I'd make fun of them, and, and then they leave. Did that help you later? Uh, what, the weighing 112 pounds? No, no, talking to people that you had nothing to talk to about. I can talk to anybody. I, I'm interested in everybody, and it's funny because people, I will have conversations with strangers, and they will say, well, you don't care about this. And I'll say, well, yeah, no, I actually do care about, like, every detail of every job and how people go about things, I'm interested in it. So you're actually curious. Very curious, yes. When you have the flavor of the week star there or actor from a series or something, and let's face it, some of them aren't deep thinkers, are you curious about those people? Yes, but I'm not necessarily curious about what you might think I'm curious about. I'm curious about their families and what they, if they had a job beforehand, a regular job, I like to put them in a different context. I try to find some area and we have pre-interviews with our segment producers in which we find, a, try to find an area of common interest and something they haven't been asked a million times. Do you find that with some of those? I find people? it, I'd say I find it with the vast majority of the guests. And some people are more interesting the, than others, and some people you vibe. It's like speed dating my job, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like when we are on together, we have good chemistry. It feels yeah. like a, a like for lack of a better, like a good date, you know? Yeah. And some of them don't. But when we're on, we actually have a conversation. Yes. It's not scripted. It's not going down a bullet list. I always work with Ken. We go over 50 things to talk about, and then we get out there and talk about like maybe none of them. Yeah, that's what I like to do. <laughs> yeah. I like to have that card as backup in case yeah. we don't happen upon anything that's yeah. particularly interesting. In case you get brain freeze or something. Yeah, or in case just in case it, the questions I ask sometimes don't go anywhere. I mean, sometimes you'll ask people, you know, like, hey, do you do this? And they're like, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you're like, okay, all right, on to the next thing. That's my nightmare is to get out there and you've got a guest that just stares at you like a dead trout. Yeah. And you get nothing from Well, them. that's that is one big difference between our jobs is I'm interviewing for the most part performers and you're interviewing civilians. And sometimes they get out there and <laughs> give you that yeah they give you the freeze sometimes that's fun but yeah yeah very seldom is that very seldom yeah very seldom is that fun
you know, that's not a good time. So what do you like talking to people about the most? Do you like talking to them about their job or their life? I like to talk to people selfishly about things I'm interested in. I like talking about cooking. I like talking about sports. I like talking about um, uh, travel. I'm interested in, in that or comic books or just things that it, it's great for me. Fishing, fly fishing, maybe more than anything. That's my producer's nightmare is if I find out one of the guests is a fly fisherman because no one's interested in hearing me talk about that yeah. except for usually the guest. Yeah, <laughs> the fly fisherman. Yeah, the other fly fisherman, which is not a huge percentage of the population. Yeah, but it is fun. It's f so much fun. I love fly fishing. I love it too. So we could ruin this whole we thing could, by talking about fly fishing. totally could ruin this whole thing. Yeah. What's the best river you've ever fished? Green or? River. Green River. Yeah. yeah. I fished the Green River, yeah. Yeah. I was on it for a couple of days. and Were you, you looking for the killer? I think I caught the same fish like 10 times. Really? And put him back. I think he was following the boat. <laughs> He'd get in, I'd say hi, put him back in. He'd follow the boat, get in and say hi. But it's fun. Yeah. Now, you do something I do because Molly is your wife. She comes to work with you every day. Wait, what are you doing with her? I'm not going to tell you. Oh. But my wife comes to work with me every day. Oh, okay. Gotcha. That's the connection. There you go. Does that work for you? Is yeah. it easy, hard? It's great. I love it. The best thing about it is we have the same vacation. Yeah, that's true. Um, occasionally, we have disputes that carry over into the home, which is not great. And, at you know, I have to say, like, you know, I, I don't want my balls busted about this. Like, we're at home now. Like, I, I'm telling you, I don't want to do it. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Sometimes she has an idea she thinks is a great idea. And I'm the worst at that. Like, when I work for people and had to convince them to do my ideas, I would torture them. I would badger them into submission until they did what I thought was funny. And so I'm the last person that should be telling her not to do it, but sometimes I do. Because, see, you got to be funny, so you got to be in a good mood, so you got to be up. And if you guys bring something to work where you're irritated with each other, does that get in your way? You know, it's a weird thing. I've had, like, I've had times in my life where I was going through personal turmoil. I, you know, family members dying, very sad things. I'm, for whatever reason, when I walk out on the stage, I am able to turn that off and just focus on the show. And like, even to the point where I have never once had to use the restroom during the show. Never. Yeah. Never either, yeah. had, because you're, your brain just goes to a different place. Somehow or another. I never hiccup. It's really weird like that your body goes along with whatever you're thinking. And then you can be exhausted after, the, you know, and suddenly you pay the, the tax. I can have the flu, and when the red light comes on, somehow or another you kind of power up, and then when it goes off you just collapse. Isn't that weird? It is weird. I don't know what it is about that. I guess it's that. You got all those people waiting. You got an audience full of people. You're going to let everybody down if you don't do it. I do think about that. And I've had nights where I didn't like the audience and, you know, I kind of sneer at them. And I, <laughs> then I think, you know what? There could be one person in that audience that, like, watches the show every night and loves it. And I don't want to be a dick while, you know. Yeah. And there may be somebody that flew in from Maine just to see the show. Yeah. And that's the night that you got a chip on your shoulder. And so they go, God. It's important to remember that, uh, and I've had times in my life where I've forgotten that, and then I have to like think about it and remind myself. And usually, it's because I'll see somebody write something like I was, you know, at the show, and he was not in a good mood. I don't know why he wasn't, you know. And then I go, like, "Oh yeah, right. You've got it. This, this, you have to entertain the audience while you're through the whole thing, not just the, the show." Yeah, Oprah gave me two good pieces of advice Oprah really Winfrey? early on. Yes, oh. Oprah Winfrey. Oh. You know her. I do know her. She said, if you don't feel like it, just don't go out there. I mean, like even in public. She said, like if you're going to the mall or something, you're going to dinner, if you don't feel like dealing and being nice with everybody, just don't go. But the show, you, you don't have that option. No, you don't with the yeah. show. Right. But she said, if you just don't feel like it, you go out there and you're rude to people, they'll tell everybody they know and everybody they know will tell everybody they know. So just right. don't do it. And she said, use the media, don't let the media use you. And I thought that was pretty good advice. It's very good advice. Because it can go the other way. I don't know way. what it means, but it really, well, 
resonates. Yeah, it sounds What does smart. that mean, use the media? Don't let the media use you. I go on, like, the Today Show or GMA or whatever. I can go on TV, I guess, about any time I want to go somewhere. Right. I don't ever go anywhere unless it's really obvious why I'm there. If somebody's watching and say, well, he's just there because he can be, instead of it's really obvious why he's here. There's been a crisis, like a school shooting, and parents want to know what to say to their children, or there's been some kind of big issue come up that is psychological in nature, and so he's here to talk about that. Unless it's really obvious why I'm there, I don't think I should be there. I've never done a talking head show. I don't ever go on like CNN panels and stuff like that. I've never done I think that's a luxury like that. you and Oprah have as, as far as being high profile people. And I think, you know, I have it as well. Maybe not everyone is able to, to do that, though. Yeah, but I'd rather not do it than do that. Yeah. Wouldn't you? Yeah, of course. But I'm fortunately not in that position or I'm just kind of like hustling to be on TV. There's definitely been times in my life where I would do things just to do things. You know, somebody called and said, Hey, do you want to be on this show? And I didn't necessarily have anything to promote. I'd just go do it just for the hell of it, just for just to raise my profile and also to. Yeah, but for you're the a fun. comedian. You can go on there and just be funny. Right. I don't have shit to say. So if I, if I don't have something to talk about, some topic or some issue, what am I going to do? Just sit there and be bald? Well, you know what? There's a certain beauty to sitting there and being bald. Look at Buddha, for instance. Yeah, there's already one of those. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that job's taken. <laughs> so, you know, I, I can't really do that. Don't so, get down on yourself, Dr. I Phil. Know, I feel I like you're... I feel like I'm just... A know, lot of people love you, you know? Making me feel really bad about myself. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's my specialty. I don't know what to do, <laughs> yeah. I feel like somebody just left the room. Hey, hey, it's Donna from Daily Dose of Donna. Every weekday afternoon on the Daily Dose of Donna podcast, I cover all of the reality TV and celeb gossip and breaking news. I'm a former TV casting director. My husband works in reality TV, and I live for the housewives, the sister wives, the southern charmers, and the summer housers. And let's be honest, all of the drama. I'll give you a day's worth of celebrity and reality news weekday afternoons in just under an hour. New episodes of Daily Dose of Donna post weekday afternoons and are now available in video on Spotify. Subscribe to Daily Dose of Donna. That's D-A-N-A on your podcast app. You don't have a problem with going to work with your wife ever? No, never. You know what the only thing? I I will tell you today when we we went to work. (laughs) Somehow she beat me there, even though I left before she did, and I was miffed. I was like, how did she get here before I did? I went up to my office, and she's already sitting there, and I felt like I'd been like bamboozled somehow. So you go at the same time? Yes. So she doesn't have to get there before you? To no, get we go at the same time, you. yeah. But you don't ride together? We don't, because she goes home earlier for the kids. Oh, she goes okay. home at the beginning of the show. She watches the monologue and heads home. Tell me how your kids are doing. They're doing great. How's your son doing? Yeah, I have two sons. Uh, one's mm-hmm. 25 years old, and mm-hmm. I have a baby, who, Billy, talking, who's... Be- talking about the baby. Right, right. But you know me. I gotta have to I have to yep. mention my other son. You have to mention him <laughs> or he'll get upset. Uh, yeah, he won't care. But it, but yes, no, he's doing great. He's uh, very cute. He eats nonstop. He's um, he's a funny little guy, and you'd never know that, there was, that he had any health issues. So is that over? No, he has to have another open heart surgery. And when will that be? When he's around seven or eight years old. They will play it by ear. Is the technology there to do what needs to be done? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I met a man who was almost 70 years old who had the surgery that my son had, which yeah. is yeah, when he was a baby, which is crazy. Yeah. Really? 70 yeah. years ago he had that yeah. surgery? He's one of the first people to have it. Good Lord. That's amazing. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that makes you feel, that gives you a little bit of relief when people tell you that. I meet people all the time. It is remarkable to me how many people have had these these heart surgeries. And um, um, it, it really, I meet people almost every day who, who tell me that they had it or somebody close to them did. Yeah. You spoke out about that a lot at the time because there are a lot of people that, if things weren't as they were at the time, there were a lot of people that would not have been able to do what needed to be done. 
And you were very, you felt very strongly about that, about health care and people having the ability to take care of their children the way you did. Yeah. And I think that uh, unfortunately it has become this partisan issue, but I don't think it is a partisan issue. I think that if you really sat people down and said, do you think that there should be uh, caps on, on insurance? Do you think that everyone should have access to health insurance that, you know, 75% would say, yeah, of course I do. You know, everybody knows somebody that needed, or maybe they needed it or, or whatever. I, I think that it's basic human nature. It doesn't matter what party you're from. If your neighbor is suffering, you want to help them. I think most people feel that way. And I don't, I, I, it's just so hard for me to understand. And it's just so hard for me to understand people who feel differently. Every society has to have a moral compass where you take care of those that can't take care of themselves. And to me, that's young children and elderly people that, you know, the two ends of the continuum, we kind of wind up where we start out. You know, we start out as infants where kind of everything has to be done for us. And we wind up the same place at the other end of the continuum when we get really old and can't work or take care of ourselves. We kind of wind up in the arc of life where we start out, where we have to be tended to. Yeah, It seems like any society with a moral compass if they're not going to do anything else, they're going to take care of the people that can't take care of themselves. That doesn't sound like a partisan issue to me. That sounds uh, like just a moral compass to society. Unfortunately, it has become that. And I think that, I think that there are certain people who did not like President Obama. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that was made is naming it Obamacare. And I think yeah. there are people that do not want to see that legacy um, go on to become something that we value, become part of the fabric of the country. And and I think that's very unfortunate. And I think almost every one of those people, when they would find themselves in a situation where they would need what, what they're not getting, would change have a change of heart. It only takes one time where you're in that John Q., situation where your kid can't get what he needs that all of a sudden, I always say politics are personal. You get in a situation where you're there and all of a sudden empathy goes way up. You realize if somebody else was in that situation that I'm in, I would feel very, very differently from that point on. Absolutely. People are, most people are good. Most people care about other people. And the idea that this has become a, a red versus blue thing, I just... I just don't believe it. I really don't. I don't believe it. I just think that people have, it's almost like sports. You pick a team and that's the team you root for and you don't necessarily pay attention to what the players are doing. But uh, in this particular case, I mean, I think there are a lot of things we can argue about. I, I don't I don't see the argument. I, I really don't. But, you know, even the people I've talked to that are dyed in the wool, Republicans will say, I'm a social Democrat and a financial Republican when it comes to the social programs like taking care of people with health care and whatever, they say, I'm completely in favor of that. I just don't like some of the other things. I think you're right. A lot of people just didn't like that name being put on it. Yeah. Well, hell, call it something else then. But you don't not take care of babies and people that can't take care of themselves. That's what I mean about being so divided that we just don't sit down and say, hey, let's forget all about that. Let's talk about this. This shouldn't be a partisan issue. I, I thought you moved the needle on that a lot. Well, I, I all I did is tell my story, and I think that people, uh, it just it put a spotlight on an otherwise boring subject. Yeah, but you put it to the forefront of the narrative in America, and you put a face on it, and you put a personal story on it, and you made people think about what we're talking about right now, that if you're in that situation, then all of a sudden it's not policy, it's personal. And now you care about the person that's in the situation. I thought you moved it to the forefront of the narrative in America. Well, uh, it, all credit goes to Billy and his heart doctors, for sure. Yeah, and they're pretty amazing over there. Oh, it's, it, the, 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 a baby's heart is not much bigger than a grape. Yeah. And they operate with knives. I mean, it's they do it the old-fashioned way. It is just unbelievable that they know how to do this. Greg and Nancy Mydell 
they had triplets over there, and one of them had to go through that, and I was involved with them with that, and I saw what they do, and it's just it's miraculous. It's just unbelievable what they do over there. And to be in L.A. where Children's is there is just amazing. Yeah, well, we're very lucky to be here. Yeah, if you sure. were in the middle of the country in some rural area, it would be a very different outcome. And Children's Hospital in Los Angeles, they train doctors from all over the country, all, all around over. the world. So yeah. it, it's not just about L.A. They, they are, they, they, what they do helps people everywhere. You through having kids? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you I didn't up, think about that very no, long. No, because I was up almost all night on Saturday night with my son, who it turns out was constipated. We couldn't figure out what was going on. And I was just like, this is it. I am not having any more. <laughs> that is that. Does she agree? Yes. I was done real early on, too. I think you should have two kids so you can play man-to-man defense. <laughs> These people that have three, four, and five kids, you have to play zone. You can't keep up with them then. It's just impossible. I spaced them out two and two. So yeah. I have a 27-year-old and 25-year-old and a four-year-old yeah. and a one-year-old. Yeah, so. See, you guys can play man-to-man. That's right. But the world's set up that way, too. All the tables are four tops. Now all the cars are four passenger. Everything's set up for two and two. So that it works true. that way. That is true. You know, I could be a grandfather soon, though. So my my daughter is engaged. So I may have a whole new wave headed my way. Yeah. You think of yourself as a grandfather? Is that hard to see yourself? Um, I can imagine it. But yeah, the label is weird. Yeah, the label's weird. Yeah. Whatever shortcomings I have as a father, I'm going to be a great grandfather. Yeah. It's so much easier. Yeah. So much easier. I bet. And you don't have to put up with any of the mistakes you make. They go home. And, and it's a great way to torture your children. Oh, of course. You just say, you remember? <laughs> remember this? So how long are you going to do what you're doing? I don't know. I, um, I've um i been doing it for 16 years, and um, I still enjoy it. I still have, you know, it's it's a lot of work. It's a grind. But I still love the jokes, and I like the people and the process, and it actually gives me a lot of structure in my life and I fear not doing it. I have fear of what if I make the wrong decision and, and stop doing it. That worries me. Why does it worry you? Cause I don't know if I'll just be like wandering the halls of my house, you know, or calling people and telling them jokes. You know? Why is it a grind? Uh, because it's every day and it's kind of relentless and there's just so much to go through. There's, there's it's just, it, you cannot feed it enough. And the show is never finished. It's, you know, you can work, I could work, I work on it from morning till night. I go home, I have homework and it, the more you put into it in general, the better it is. So it's just never finished. How many do you do a year? We are, uh, we do 44 weeks of shows a year. 44 weeks of shows a year? Yeah. So you, what's that, 220 something? Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of shows. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a hard job. It's, you know, it's not, it's not, when the days of Johnny Carson strolling in from the tennis court to yeah. do the show from, uh, you know, from three to six are gone. Well, that's what I say. This days of just people sitting on couches and talking is long gone. Yeah. Now you got to have packages and video and field shoots and all that stuff. And I'm not complaining. You do 50 shows a year more than I do. Yeah, it's a lot of shows. A lot of shows. <laughs> and and the, putting the monologue together is most of it. You know, you come out and you do a 15-minute completely new, you know, play every night. Is it kind of over once you've done that? Is that more than half of the show for you? Yeah, definitely. So once that's done, you just got to sit down and talk to whoever. The guest segments there. Are, are easy. They're, that's not a ton of work. Yeah. So once you're over the monologue, then you get to sit down and talk to somebody. You know, yes. they flame out. They flame out. Yeah. I mean, I still, I always want this, them to do well. I want the show yeah. to be good, but there's only so much you can do. Yeah. There's only so much you can do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know how that goes. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. So you'll do this for? Would you do it for twenty years? Maybe. Maybe. I'm not far off. You started one year after I did. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You called me on the first day. Uh, I did. The f second day, actually. You called me the day after you our premiere. And I yeah. thought it was a prank call. <laughs> <laughs> I never understood. Why did you think it was a prank? Because I'm constantly making prank calls. So I'm very aware, cognizant of that type of thing. And plus, 
I didn't know you. And the idea that Dr. Phil would be calling me was very, was, you know, very odd. So I, of course, had to get your number and call you back. <laughs> Actually, no, Adam Carolla said, ask him, I had you on the phone, ask him what kind of car his son drives, because this is the sort of thing that Adam knows. And I asked you and you answered. And I was like, he's like, yeah, all right. Yeah, it's him. <laughs> yeah. Well, I called because I'm a fan, and the show was so great the first night, I called to congratulate well, you. Well, you're nice to say that, but that's not actually true. <laughs> well, it is true. There's, uh, if you really, my vision of hell is having to watch <laughs> the first year of the shows on a loop. Oh, it went well. I mean, come on, you got it renewed. It felt like it went well. At You've the been time. renewed for 16 years. Come yeah, on. Yeah. It they changed well your time slot. They moved you up. They did, yeah. Were you happy about that? Yes, very. very. You know, it was weird. We were on at 12.05 a.m. for right. you know, a long time. And when we moved to 11.30, it was only uh, 11.35. It was only a 30-minute time shift, but it was huge as far as just suddenly there were so many, it seemed like there were so many people watching. Well, there's a lot more people using televisions 30 minutes earlier. Yeah. A whole lot of America's asleep later. It's interesting, though, when you feel it, when you like really like get that yeah. you know different response from people, whether you're in public or even just stepping out on stage. Do you have a favorite late night host? David Letterman. Yeah. Well, he's not on anymore. Yeah. Oh, he's my all-time favorite. What'd you like about it? Why? This was so unusual. I'd never seen anything like it. He um, he seemed to have no, he, 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 this was like no bullshit. You know, he was, um, he was, he'd mow through the guests if he felt like it, if they didn't, if they, they seemed like they were phonies or whatever. And I, I never missed the show. I worship David Letterman. Yeah. He was quirky, but really smart, really smart and really, really funny. He spent like I guess a year doing words of wisdom from Doctor Phil. Mm -hmm, that's and right. Yeah. Remember he would he'd take <laughs> half sentences and put them together, <laughs> and then he would play that. And then he had like <laughs> new books from Doctor Phil. And he like, my favorite one was more advice I just pulled out of my ass. <laughs> and he had like a whole book cover and everything done. <laughs> and he was just relentless about this for like a year, year and a half. <laughs> and then I came on the show uh -huh. and he was really nervous when I came on the show because they called me to do the pre-interview. Yeah. And the pre-interview, I said, no, no pre-interview uh -huh. except this. Tell him I'll do this nasty or I'll do it nice. And he can decide, and he doesn't need to tell me until I get there. <laughs> that's the pre-interview. I'll see you tomorrow night. <laughs> and that's all I said. They went, well, okay. And they hung up. And when I got there, he was so appreciative and so nice because he said, I make fun of people all the time, and they never come on the show. They always get pissed off. They always pout. And you're here, and it's just great. And it was one of the highest rated shows that he ever had because he had been dogging on me. We had I a great that. time. Yeah, I know. We had a great time. And he said, you know, I might have said a thing or two. <laughs> and I said, well, actually, I have a list. <laughs> of what He said, oh, I didn't know you had data. <laughs> and It is funny when you hear that stuff read back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. like quack. Half-baked quack, fat boy, looks like the guy that approves your check at the grocery store, uh, all of that. And uh, But we had a great time. And I, I did that show, I don't know, probably 50 times. And right. I, I really enjoyed him. Yeah. So who do you like that's on the air? Um, well, for different reasons, I like, uh, I like, you know, I like a lot of a lot of these guys. I think I have this appreciation for what they do that I think we have mutually. The days of late night being like uh, a thing where you hated your competitors have really gone away and people oh, yeah, don't believe it's not that it. Way at all. It isn't that way at all. And I think a big part of it is because many more of our viewers come online now. So you don't have to choose between the shows. You just pick the parts of the shows that you want to see. So there isn't that intense competition for guests for in that time slot. It just doesn't exist anymore. And a lot of those, I think that those competitive feelings go away. And so, I mean, I would say that, uh, I mean, guys that I'm 
I have an actual friendship with Colbert and Fallon, Seth Meyers, um, James Corden. I know a little bit, and he's, he seems like a very nice guy. Um, you know, and I know people think like, oh, it's more fun when we hate each other, but we don't. You know, people don't believe it for some reason. Like Steve Harvey and I are really good friends. You know, I've I known Ellen that. forever. We, you know, no. just <laughs> you know, people no, don't of believe course, it. Of course. Why would you? What would? Why would you and Steve Harvey hate each other? We'd go on each other's shows. We even on different networks, and we cross pollinate each other's shows. We do like competitions. Sometimes we do half of it on Your his show and half buddies. of it on exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, we we have a good time doing it. People love that stuff, and they like to make it into something. And people certainly loved it when it was Jay and Dave, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and and Conan too. Well, by I forgot Conan. Yeah, as as another yeah. guy that uh, you know, I I'm in awe of what he's done over his career. He's very smart too. Very smart, smart and guy. very and very original as well. Yeah, is it true you can fall asleep on a ladder? Yes, you that can is fall true. Sleep anywhere. Yep. For like long time or just for a few minutes. I could fall. I if once I'm asleep, I I'll stay asleep for. I have a weird thing. I've I did morning radio, so I used to wake up at three o'clock in the morning. I go into work, and so I had to take a nap in the middle of the day. And I figured out what my sleep cycle is. It's an hour and forty one minutes exactly. I set my alarm for an hour and forty one minutes. I fall asleep within three, four, five minutes, and that's perfect for me. I wake up, I get through a whole sleep cycle. And I, I think that if you, I, I timed it, I'd add a little time, I'd subtract a little time, and I finally got to that number, and it's consistent. And if I get an hour and 41 minutes sleep, I'm in great shape. Really? Yeah. I also have narcolepsy. So I, I've, you know, I've fallen asleep driving. Um, I pulled up next to a police officer and I nodded off, and this one female police officer <laughs> announces through the head, the, uh, loudspeaker are you awake enough to drive that vehicle i said i am now <laughs> <laughs> i f i fall asleep on the plane before it takes off and sometimes sleep through landing really i've had to be awake and i don't take you know uh any like sleep pills or anything like that it's all just natural well you've fallen asleep twice since you've been here i'm sleeping right now yeah I just, i'm able to chat do you dream when you fall asleep? I, I do, I'm sure, but I rarely remember my You don't parents. remember them? No. That's really interesting. My daughter's been having these nightmares where she talks loudly, and she's four years old, and I was talking to my wife about this this morning because I think it's really cute. You know, she doesn't know about, like, mo the most she knows about, like, monsters is Cookie Monster, you know, and she doesn't know about bad guys and that kind of stuff. But so what she has nightmares about are, are skunks spraying her because that's what she knows about. And so she was having this nightmare. She's yelling like all night long. And I said to her, what are you, what are you, why, what's going on? What do you, and she said, a skunk was spraying me. And it's kind of <laughs> cute and innocent that uh, at four years old, the greatest villain in the world is a skunk. Have they figured out that you're TV famous? They don't know. My kids don't know what's. They don't understand. Like I, the first movie I took my daughter to see in the theater was Boss Baby, and I played. I'm the voice of the dad in that movie, and it didn't phase. Of course, I was disappointed. I thought she was going to be so excited, but it didn't phase her at all because she doesn't know that everyone's father isn't the voice of a character in a movie or that everyone's dad isn't on TV. Yeah, they don't get it. My grandkids, they walk through and I'm on the screen. They go, yeah, whatever. They, I don't think there's a difference even anymore to them between being taped on your phone and none. being on television. Absolutely oh, The none. one thing my daughter does take note of, and she said to my wife, Daddy knows everybody. Yeah. <laughs> because strangers will come up to me, and that she doesn't understand. Yeah, but they don't get it because we're a YouTube generation, so everybody's on a screen. Right. That's what it is. Everybody's on a screen to them. So the fact that we're on doesn't make any difference. Yeah, it's no difference. They're hard to impress. And I keep trying to explain them. I'm a real celebrity, kids. But yeah. They do, they I'm not just... a YouTube star. <laughs> I have a real show on a real network. I'm not an influencer. That's right. <laughs> I know some, but I'm not one. <laughs> I'm not one of them. Yeah. Well, will your kids be in uh, entertainment? Would you let them do it? Well, my son works at my show, and he's interested right. in comedy. My daughter's an artist. She lives out in the Mojave Desert, and she makes ceramics. 
my um, two little kids, eh, whatever they want to do, I'd get a kick out of it if they were interested in it. I've had a good experience. So I think a lot of people have, you know, a very difficult experience. I just, I, I've had, I've had a lot of fun doing the radio jobs and then doing the game show and the man show. And I've just had a, well, the best part is really being able to work with my friends. And that's something that most people don't get to do. I'm the same way. I never aspired to do this, but it's been a great thing to do. Yeah. I enjoy doing it. It's to be a big left turn for you, really. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. You know, I was a trial consultant and we never gave interviews. You know, people come up and say at a big trial and say, um, who are you? I said, I'm not here. We didn't want anybody to know what we were doing or where we were. Never gave an interview ever. Had no desire to be on television and can't stay off of it. Do you think you would still be doing that had you not gotten into television? No. You'd be retired now? I don't know, but I wouldn't be doing that because I had done it all. I had done every big litigation there was to do. And I knew when it was time to stop because I remember the day I was at CSI. It was called Courtroom Sciences, CSI before CSI. And an 18-wheeler pulled up in front of our building to drop off a case file. And the copy bill, just to copy the file, was a million dollars. <laughs> and when I saw the truck pull up, I was like, oh, God. And when a case pulls in that it's a million dollars to copy, and you're going, oh, no. It's time to do something else because that wow. means you're going to keep your whole company busy for like five years. Right. And you're going, oh, no, please go somewhere else. And when Oprah came it's into your life, quit. did she float in or was it, did she come in on her feet or how did that, that occur? Yeah, it was interesting. I got a call that morning from her trial lawyer and her company president at the same time to hire us for that case, and neither of them know the other one was calling. Really? Yeah, because they went to trial to try to get it dismissed on summary judgment, and the judge denied it, said, you're going to trial. And so trial counsel called, and the president of Harpo called and said, hey, we're going to trial. We need you to go to trial. Have you ever sent that that judge a little gift to thank him for, <laughs> <laughs> for the fact that you have a motorcycle in your office now? <laughs> it, was a, it was a federal judge in Amarillo, and we were behind enemy lines because it was the cattle grower suing right. her. I remember we were picking the jury, and she leaned up, tapped me on the shoulder, and said, I don't see any of my peers over there supposed to be a jury of your peers. I don't see anybody over there that looks like me. There was not one African-American on the jury, not one. Wow. And she said, you sure we ought to be doing this? <laughs> I said, no, we're okay. Don't worry about it. Were you confident at that time or are you just, or are you just no, BSing I, Oprah? No, I was confident at that time. Although halfway through the trial, we do the trial strategy. And halfway through the trial, made a 90-degree right turn strategically and went a completely different direction than we had prepared to go. Really? Yeah, so we had done like seven or eight mock trials, had been worked on the case for two years, and halfway through the trial said, that's a wrong way to go. We're going a completely different way. Changed it halfway through. Wow. Just like your life, in a yeah, way. Yeah, that was a gut check right there. That's when you wake up at night and go, oh, my God. Yeah. I hope this is the right instinct. Can you imagine if Oprah did 40 years in prison because you did not make yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be good. <laughs> I don't think she was going to go to prison, but they were suing her for a couple of billion dollars. Yeah. I mean, at that point, you'd rather go to prison, I guess. Yeah. She was gutsy. She said, what can I do to help? I said, well, you could move the Oprah show to Amarillo. <laughs> she turned around, hit the button, said, find me a place to do the show in Amarillo. And she moved it to a place called the Little Theater in uh, Amarillo. Wow. Did the show down there for a month while we were in trial. You think that wasn't a hot ticket in Amarillo? I would think so, yeah. Yeah, that helped. Yeah. She was a great client. And we've been in business together one way or another now for like 25 years. It's a good, good partner to have. Yep, good partner to have. 
People ask me, what's the secret to being number one? You say, you've been number one forever. What's the secret? I say, she quit. <laughs> That's <laughs> you know the secret. You know, it's, no one's ever asked me what the secret to being number one is in my yeah. whole life. Well. Never happened. Well, get some people to quit. That's what I did. <laughs> Everyone else to quit. <laughs> yeah, I got Oprah to quit. And that was it. No problem. <laughs> Well, you've been doing your show, and so I know you're tired, so I'll let you go. This is fun. You're sticking with the name fill in the blanks. You're sticking with that. Is the person who came up with that 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 title in this room right now with no. us? No. That no. was my son, Jordan. Oh, that's right. Your son, Jordan, came up so with this. So you want to finish this ridiculing my children. Is that what you're saying? Just Jordan. Just that one child. You're just going to ridicule that one child. I'm not going to all your children. They yeah. didn't, only Jordan came up with this ridiculous yeah, title. Just him. <laughs> I don't know. You like this title. No, I don't like the title. Well, rename it. Well, I, you know, I came up with a lot of suggestions and you ignored them. They were terrible. Win, loser, McGraw. Oh, McGraw talk. Like raw, but you, we make the words raw red. Okay. Yeah. You raw, know what I'm raw saying? Raw McGraw. Or what about just the Dr. Phil podcast? Dr. Phil in time. How about that? Lassie could figure out the Dr. Phil podcast. What is that? How about, um, what's your middle name? Calvin. Oh, really? Yeah. What's yours? Christian. Don't make fun of Jesus. You know, you can't attack Christian. I know that. Christian. Really? Calvin? Yeah. All right. Calvin's in the Bible. You can't pick on that. Calvin's in the comics. Calvin is not in the Calvin Calvin's, and Hobbes. Yeah, right. Calvin's in the Bible? Well, Christian is in the Bible. He's the main guy. Number one. Is there a book of Christian? Kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> more or less. Yeah. More anyway, or less. I'm just saying, uh, if you want, I will I will submit another list of titles, but um I fill in the blanks is is ridiculous. You just don't like it. I don't like it, no. So you hate it enough that you won't listen? I no, I'm not saying I'm, I'm it's just it's it's a ridiculous title for a podcast. You're making a mockery of the podcast industry. <laughs> Fill in the blanks. I am I the blank? Like what's the like what does that mean? I'm filling in the blanks about your life. Oh. You have no idea what I'm going to say about you when you leave. Oh. Well, why don't you say that at the beginning? Now it makes sense. See, people think they know you because you come out in a suit every day. Uh-huh. You've got a social mask. So you put this suit on. You come out there and say, hey, see, look at me. I'm in a suit. I'm credible. So you should believe the stuff I say. You know what? I'm a I'm big enough man to apologize to Jordan now that I understand the that there is actually uh, an idea behind this ridiculous pun title. So you don't like any of my titles. You make fun of my show titles. You yeah. make fun of my podcast titles it's your only flaw really you really need to work on the titles no that you know what the show titles are great they're just funny well they're descriptive like i keep telling people you need to make these titles less than a paragraph yeah they are long they yeah. are long but in fairness to them there are a lot of shows so you got to come up with something yeah yeah but they could just say 2009 42 they could just call it that. Yeah, that's no fun, though. No, it's better than my teenagers no uh, having sex with her astrologer. Yeah, I've something like that. I've got one tomorrow that my father was killed by a police sniper, and our family is falling apart. It's very specific. That's very specific. He was robbing a bank. A police sniper killed him, and now the family's all in turmoil. Well, that's a that horrible really story. Well, that mean, really happened. Yeah. I mean, I believe it. Sure. Yeah. They got the video footage. They were watching live on television when a police sniper shot him. Oh, boy. Wow. Isn't that bad? They were teenagers. They're watching there. So who, oh, there's that. Uh, oh. Yeah, that's no good. Yeah. I think I have Angela Bassett on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I think I win. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I'm going to try to fill in the blanks for them yeah, on what you the tell yourselves now. Yeah. So, but I'll do that tomorrow and you talk to Angela Bassett. Very good. <laughs> She's a big fan. Tell her I said hi. All right. I will. Yeah. Thanks for <laughs> Thanks, doing Dr. this. Phil. All right. We'll see you, man. All right. If you would like to watch the video of this entire interview, please go to Dr. Phil's YouTube channel and subscribe. It's free, and you will find this interview and a whole lot more.